Hello everyone. This is the Nanobox Razzmatazz, a digital drum synth by 1010 Music, and one of the coolest sound design jobs I've ever had. Razzmatazz is a digital drum synth, and like the other Nanoboxes in this series, Raz has an extremely small form factor. The touchscreen is great for creating new sounds and tapping out your own beats, which can be recorded in real time or step by step in the Super Stepper. I had the honor to be one of the sound designers for this project, working beside drummer, sound designer, and living legend, Reek Havoc. Together we made 120 presets, and the first 60 are mine. Razzmatazz has three available sound sources, two FM oscillators and a sample wave file. You can import a wave or sample your own using the line input. Advanced wave file playback includes clip and slicer modes. Designing sounds in Razzmatazz is fast, intuitive, and quite honestly, a lot of fun. In this demonstration, I took a basic snare model and altered it using the FM feature. Use Raz in your tabletop setup or expand your digital drum sounds with Raz using the MIDI input. It works great with my Roland TD-17. Also, my Presonus Adam. Let's check out the Super Stepper. Long press the home button to access the teleporter page and tap the sequence button. You get 16 pattern slots. Press the top left hamburger to access copy, paste, clear, and double sequence link. Page right to access the super stepper. You can select from eight pad sounds. The pip indicator to the right shows you what section of the sequence you are in, depending on the number of steps you set. Page right again to access the velocity sequencer for each step and pad. Page right once more to change the step length and step count. Patterns are set to 16 by default. There aren't any more pages after that, so press the top right measure indicator to access the sequencer's transport. Here we have BPM, swing, tap, tempo, and metronome. Creating a pattern in the Super Stepper is fast, fun, and intuitive. Let's start with an empty sequence. Choose a pad and drop a note in the desired steps. I think I'm getting ready to drop some real-time recording in from the pads. In order to do so, sometimes turning on the metronome helps keep time. Let's double the sequence length.
We can also record parts in real time by pressing record on the transport. And now we can tap pads in real time to record them. Now let's hop on over to the velocity sequencer and change the velocity settings for some of the hi-hat parts. If for some reason those changes don't seem to be doing anything, you'll have to go into that individual pad's envelope settings and adjust the velocity range there. If this is set to zero, you'll just get the same velocity level across the board no matter what. So let's go ahead and crank that up. This also applies to external MIDI triggers. If the pad's not responding to velocity via your controller, then go back and check out what I showed you in the envelope settings for that pad. See you at Synthplex. Hey everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel once again. This is Jason, your host, and I'm here with my old friend, Aaron Higgins, and really stoked to, uh, Aaron, to have you today on the show. And um, and we, we go way back, probably, what, late 90s or something, so. Yes, yes, we do. Cool, it's, cool. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for, for, uh, for you know, taking the time out, out of your busy schedule and hanging with us. Um, and so Aaron, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just say that Aaron is like an entrepreneur. He's very talented and, um, he has had several successful businesses over the years and his most recent is involvement is called 1010 music. I'm sure a lot of people watching are familiar with your company. Um, and, um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about that, that'd be really cool. Sure. So 1010 music is a small boutique a uh, music gear company that we specialize in touchscreens. Uh, we took all the best ideas from plugins and from iOS apps and uh, repackaged them into uh, your rack modules and tabletop gear. I uh, originally started with something called the Bitbox, which is a sampler, looper, um, clip player, uh, in, employing a 3.5 inch touchscreen and is a, a module that's been on the market now for about five years, uh, all the way on to just now where we released a smaller compact unit called the nano box which jason has there in the back um, there's two of them there's a red one and a yellow one jason's showing yeah. off the lemon drop which a it's just a granular polyphonic synthesizer um up to four notes of 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 poly with two oscillators so you get a total of 128 grains across two different files and a sub oscillator at the same time um, we do a variety of things you largely by nature of having touch screen based hardware, you're doing a lot of the same software based stuff, of course, with the additional burden of having to build hardware. Um, but that gives you a lot of important uh, control and flexibility, like choosing what the form factor is, choosing what the ins and outs are, how many channels do you have, you know, throwing some physical knobs and some physical interface and you know, physical transport buttons on it. So we've, we've really enjoyed the opportunity to do some cool stuff in that space. Um, it's great to be working with people like Jason who can do some incredible sound design and really bring things like the black box to life. So, um, it's very much a collaboration with a lot of talented people. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And it's kind of like, you know, you're given this, this task, like, especially, I mean, your devices are already small, but now you're getting, getting even smaller. So, you know, that's, that's kind of like, let's see, how can we work with the limitations of the size of the device and still make everyone happy? And um, like you said, with different ins and outs and things that you can cram into the, the you know, 
the software and then give accessibility via it. So, you know, I'm just like, I mean, this is crazy. And by the way, the build of this little guy is pretty cool. I mean, it's plastic, but these knobs are great. Like it, it just feels really solid right here. And the touchscreen is very nice. Um, and, it, and the funny thing is like, speaking about size with this, I, I needed something. It's funny. Like I just really needed a tiny little ambient generator, like ambient soundscape generator for, for like my little tabletop setup over here um, because it's on top of a bookshelf and I had very limited space and this thing fit perfectly. It's so cool. And um, I actually did a real quick kind of test jam with it on my other YouTube channel. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link to that up there uh, and in the description if anyone wants to check it out. But it's so cool. You, you don't even need it, a keyboard connected to it. You can just hit the whole button and it'll play. And there's a little sequence in there, sequencer in there that you can modulate the sound in ways that you don't even really have to play. You can just let it drone and it, it sounds very alive with the panning. It's very wide. And um, there's a lot of changing with the, you know, modulating the granule, the grand, sorry, granular synthesis uh, position and things like that. So, um, and it's all crammed into this tiny little box. So, I mean, that had to be fun and challenging, just figuring out what you, you know, and I'm sure you have a mega list of, of features and things, and then you guys have to keep like, maybe like kind of chiseling away at it until it just fits. Yeah. No, it's, it's certainly you know, any product development. There's always a like enormous list of features and, and you can't make everybody happy and you can't even make yourself happy. I mean, it's always right, right. like some amount of like sacrifice of what, what will fit, what makes sense, what's jumping the shark and shouldn't be in there in the first place. Right. Um, but you know, we did, and we were inspired by like how small is too small. I mean, if you look at your typical Euro rack setup, those mm -hmm. knobs and cables are all crammed together in you know even right. a much much worse more dense kind of way like a two HP module like that's that's a thing mm -hmm. but you know in yeah, some yeah. regards it's, it's a bit nuts um, so we wanted to dial, dial the nuts back a little bit and get something that you know <laughs> does a lot in a small package but still sits on the desktop with a lot of other stuff if anything we find you know, some of the classic old gears just kind of ridiculously big and people have brought to our attention that you could yeah. fit several several of these inside a traditional keyboard or you know on top of you know using the dead space of a traditional keyboard mm -hmm. um, so it's it's certainly it's not for everybody we know it doesn't have a not per function and it's you know does certain things well but it's it's a, a trade-off that's great for a suitcase rig or great for somebody with not a lot of space or somebody in an apartment you know or somebody who wants to have like just a little mini setup that they can throw in their bag and set up on the fly so it, it solves sure. a number of problems and we wanted to you know to, to ask the question like how small is too small mm. yep yep and um and there's another one um the fireball and that's uh, a synthesizer as well a wavetable synth i believe and it's pretty cool i don't have that here in the studio but it's a little red synth right so the the lemon drops sibling is the fireball which is looks very much the same it's bright red has a bright red cable Mm -hmm. um, but the emphasis is on wavetable synthesis. You can either use one of a hundred some wavetables that we build into it, or you can load your own. So if you access to like stuff online, you can put any number of different wavetables onto the micro SD card, which means, you know, enormous amount of space. I mean, kind of almost you're ridiculously big. You'll sooner get tired of having so many presets than you will like run out of micro SD space. <laughs> so it's... Right. It's it's fun to play with that stuff. It's also you know it gives you sort of the ultimate flexibility in creating a, a wavetable that goes from A to Z or you know B to F or whatever you need. Mm -hmm. And you know whether it's sampling something or recreating some sound or just you know making your own thing. It's a very different way to work, but it's you know in many ways similar to how the lemon drop works. Same ins and outs, um, same reliance on a micro SD card that lets you easily import and export your own samples. Um, and you know it has some very basic built-in control of the notes but really comes to life once you hook it up to an external keyboard or a sequencer right right yeah it's uh yeah, it's really cool and and i think having the sd card and that's one thing you know a lot of your boxes like i have i do have the black box here which is really cool a drum machine sampler type kind of like a four by four uh you know mpc style you know kind of grid on it and whatnot for triggering samples and then blue box, uh, digital mixer, 
So, and they all have, it's so cool. They all have a little SD card for updating and then storing your data. And, um, and that's just so great. I mean, so it's so convenient for me. I just pop it in and boom. And now I've got all my stems over there on my desktop and whatever. You know, we've tested cards that go up to 512 gigabytes, which, you know, you and I are both old enough to remember using samplers with floppy disk drives. It's just okay. utterly ridiculous the amount of space you have. And, you know, when our factory calls us and says, you know, hey, um, we're sorry, they're discontinuing the 16 gig cards. Is okay. So if we include a 32 gig card instead and like, okay. And, you know, these things are, you know, make the audio storage just seem limitless and free. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I, I, I still have my SideQuest removable cartridge drive. It's a 44 megabyte cartridge. And I had that hooked up to my Insonic sampler in the nineties. I don't have the sampler anymore, but I still have the drive. I think it still works. You just plug it in with a SCSI port, you know, big wide cable that weighs like a ton and, um, but only 44 megs. So it's crazy. I mean, that was on a big cartridge and then they came out with zip disks and stuff yeah. later and it just kept getting smaller. But now, I mean, it's ridiculous what you can fit on these little SD cards and it, it's brilliant. You know, that you had that on every, all these devices have it. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great idea that we were taking we took from the Raspberry Pi that just you know, load everything on the disk, make it so that it's interchangeable, and you can just you know throw one piece of hardware away and stick this disk in another piece of hardware if you know you're on the road and you need to have like redundant backups, you can do that kind of thing because they're just interchangeable, humongous, and you know easy to put your hands on. Right, right, totally. So yeah, super stoked about those. A lot of people are, and then the word traveled really fast. Um, I found that, you know, <laughs> the lemon drop, even like I, when I published a, uh, something this weekend, um, about it, like so many people commented, they wanted to know more about the lemon drop and I didn't even, I wasn't even really featuring it. It was more of just like a little jam session, just kind of tabletop thing with the lemon drop in it. And, um, and it's just so crazy that there's so much buzz. Like it just really, you've guys with your, your company has been around for how long? Uh, we originally founded in 2016. So what is okay. that? Seven years? Yeah. So within seven years, years, yeah, you've definitely, you hit the industry hard. I mean, seven years now, every, everybody in this, if you're into music production, hardware and whatnot, they know, they know 1010 music. And so like when these little, and, and it was brilliant how you announced the the launch and whatnot. I thought that was pretty cool too. It was real kind of mysterious at times and, 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 and quick. And, and, and then shortly after that, we got all the long technical videos, which is cool. Um, and so it just, there's a lot of us. I hope, I hope you're having a hard time keeping up with the, with demand, to be honest. <laughs> no, we are. I mean, we've already sold okay. out of lemon drops within our own internal collections. The retailers nice. still have some. Um, so yeah, it's off to a great start. Um, granted, you know, the supply chain makes things a little more difficult this time right. around, but, um, yeah. you know, we're happy to be having a product at all. I mean, it's not, the price point is not exactly where we wanted it to be, but it's, you know, happy to be here and yeah, you're right. It's, it's great to see a lot of buzz. Um, there was, there was a lot of work and preparation put in, putting into having, you know, lots of different reviewers and retailers ready to launch videos all at the same time. So it looks yeah. like, you know, an explosion happens, but it's a lot of build up to, to make uh, that a possibility. I, I can only imagine. So, which leads me to uh, was a question that I had for you about like supply, you know, and demand and, and, and right now with like a lot of the like weird shortages and stuff with, because of the pandemic or whatever, uh, it's, it's like everything seems to be taking a lot longer these days. Uh, and, and there's some hangups maybe in China or whatever, where you, you know, you might get some, I don't know if that's where you get some of your electronic components, but um, so like, how long would you say it does it take to go from you know proof of concept or whatever to to especially now recently in this day and age to having that completed product in hand yeah it really depends i mean i'd say under normal circumstances taking a proof of concept to like finished product is about a year for us because you need oh, really? to go through okay. three or four rounds of prototypes mm -hmm. um you need to you know you're generally dealing with some sort of pre-existing assets and formulating them into something that's, you know, a next generation product, mm -hmm. you know, usually for us, like sourcing a screen is a big deal. You coming up with the enclosure, 
you know, getting prototypes made of that, like, does it fit right? Does it look right? Are the colors yeah. and the paint and the silk screen where it needed to be? Uh, and then, of course, several iterations with the software. Um, so that's under normal circumstances. This time around, you know, it was longer than that. I guess we 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 went through various trade offs to get to get stuff here. Okay. Um, under normal circumstances, we can place an order with our our longstanding factory in China and get something in three to four months. This time around, it's like if we had used that standard process, it'd be sure you can have that in fourteen months. <laughs> but we had okay. to. But we made various trade offs and paid extra to get stuff on an accelerated basis, and sure. and that's part of the reason why the price point is what it is. It's not where we wanted it to be. It's not you know the least expensive thing out there. But you know, hey, would you rather have it now or in six right. to twelve months? It's kind of like that's the the trade off. And then at some point, as you start to line things up, mm-hmm. you see it's it's hard not to like pay the extra and get it all together, and so that you can ship something. Um, I guess we're we're fortunate that our factory has been able to broker several deals, and you know, plenty of the stories you've probably heard is we had issues where we ordered something in May, and then our suppliers or our factory suppliers would say that you can have that, but we're not sure when, and then you ha- you have to go like source an alternative version. In some cases, like the CPU is very specialized, and you're not going to get that from an alternative source. Okay. Um, so you're having to just like, you know, can you get an alternative part number? Can you buy some from somebody who has surplus? You know, in some cases, the answer is yes, but you're generally looking at paying two to five times face value, which are like sort of ugly trade offs, but oh, sometimes necessary. Um, you know, just a lot of like way more substitutions and, okay, you can't have that. How about this instead? And, it was a lot more scrambling. I mean, it's ultimately worth it, but it was just way less uh, straightforward and, and smooth than, than past uh, product releases. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, like, uh, I don't know, last year, year before that, I, uh, I placed an order for, uh, um, a, if you've seen Sonicware, that company, the guy who makes the mm-hmm. 8-bit, I got the 8-bit warps live in. It's such a long, weird name for synth, but um, and it's really cool. I saw it at NAMM a few years ago. And then it took them so long. They kept having a lot of delays, but you're fortunate enough now you have, maybe that he just didn't have kind of those sort of uh, relationships already with, with um, people that could, like you said, could, you know, barter whatever better, you know, uh, um, a faster, uh, you know, results. But, um, and so it took them a long time and there were a lot of hangups and stuff. And so I was kind of wondering, you guys, it still seems pretty fast for you. Like, I, I, I didn't even see this coming, like, lemon drop. It was just like, boom. Oh, cool. Um, so that's why I was curious uh, if you had such delays and whatnot. But um, Yeah, I guess I, I will say that we could have brought something to market as, as early as last fall. But the delays, if anything, helped us out because it enabled us to get two products lined up. And so we have right. a product line at launch time as opposed to just one you know, with another one coming soon. So ultimately, I think it worked out. Um, it's just, you know, it could have been easier. And we look forward to, you know, hopefully late this year, maybe into next year where prices and supply chains get back to normal and we're not fronting so much, you know, capital to get stuff sort of pre-ordered and pre-pre-ordered so mm-hmm. that we can see stuff later in the year and, and we will be able to do things more quickly and, you know, expeditiously. Nice. Very cool. So, um, and I won't ask you, like, I know everybody wants to know, is there, do you have, you, hopefully you guys have a lot more in the works. Um, do you plan on surprising us with something very soon or is that something you care to share? Yeah, that's, that's fair. That's a fair okay. question. Okay. I mean, we've, if anything, we've really saved up and like, you know, dropped a big one here with, with right. the two nanobots launches. Uh, we're, we obviously have several things in the works, you know, okay. m- most of which we're not ready to talk about, sure. but you know, there's, there's more stuff coming and, you know, we're always, listening to what people are saying, you know, we're happy to hear that this form factor is a success and that people mm-hmm. like it. So, you know, you might see more things in the same vein. Um, that said, you know, like our other products, we'd like to keep them up to date and you can expect to see more updates there. And we're mindful of like what people are asking for and nice. what's possible. And, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse having software. You can, you know, constantly keep updating it and doing stuff and get it keep, creates kind of an ongoing, you know, obligation and expectation that you will do that. Right, right. Of course. But also, you know, well, with somebody saying, oh, well, uh, you know, the price for these is a little, a little high, you know. Yeah, but look what they do. They have to keep updating this software for all their devices. There's a lot of time and effort and that keeps this, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving, you know, you're lucky that 1010 is on top of that because some companies, they just kind of, you know, 
they send it off and, and you might not see an update for many years or whatever, or ever. <laughs> uh, it depends, but, but, you know, and it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. It's like, you know, you just paid for a lifetime subscription to maybe cool, some cool new features that might pop up again in the future for that device. So, um, that's kind of how I justify it. Um, plus I know you're a boutique company and, you know, it's just not easy. I mean, <laughs> it's a music business, you know, it's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's tough. So, um, but that, that's cool. So let's see with that said, I did have, I think I had something I wanted to ask you and I wrote it down because I, I often forget what I want to ask people, <laughs> but, um, uh, so, Oh yeah. So, so I wanted to just kind of get an idea about 1010 music, the company itself. Um, it used, uh, we talked earlier and you said the company's growing. I know it was just you and maybe a couple people in the beginning. Um, I know that you, uh, so you've had, so everyone knows, and, and I just want to show you, show everybody this because we are on my iOS channel. This is Looptastic. So this is kind of, this is where Aaron, uh, was at back in, I don't know, well, this is on the iPad. So this is the HD version. So, but this thing goes back to the uh, first gen iPhone, um, this right. app. And um, that's that's something we worked on. I was, to, you know, creating loops for it. And, but you guys were, it was mostly you, I think, programming this app, correct? Or maybe there was one other person. No, um, at, at, uh, for a while there, we had two of us, uh, myself and another programmer, and we had a marketing okay. person, Right. Um, and then it was that that effort was eventually acquired by Native Instruments and mm -hmm. formed the backbone of um, Tractor DJ. The one the one point version released was that now like twenty thirteen or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's those are some great times. I mean, you know, it's funny you pull out the Looptastic one. Like we actually developed that. Um, we finished the app and posted it to Apple before the iPad actually existed. We were working entirely on software simulators. Mm -hmm. um, it was you know a giant leap of faith. Like for example, we were as as we we're submitting the product to the store, didn't we know how much RAM the iPad had because oh, wow. Apple hadn't disclosed that. We're granted we had to assume like okay, more than the phone, but um, yeah. it was a you know a fun time. Um, those early days were you know really rewarding, and um, you know it was the wild west. Um, it was great to work with people like yourselves and do you just kind of a couple of guys could get together and and do something miraculous and. And people would just be astonished with what you could do in the, you know, the time and the reach of the app store was pretty amazing that, you know, anyone around the world could pick up blue plastic and, you know, hear our work and, you yeah. know, do their own music. Um, and granted that's sort of changed. I mean, granted it's, it's way more competitive and now like, you know, it's, it's the wild wild west to an extreme that everybody can get in and every high school or a college student can submit something and make a few bucks or do it for free just because it's a fun hobby. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's much less of a viable business now than it was at that time when we were doing, you know, much more groundbreaking, maybe the same sort of stuff, but the level of interest and sort of the level of expectation and how people, what impressed people was so much lower back then than right, it is right. now. Yeah, and it was groundbreaking. I mean, I remember, you know, Looptastic was time stretching loops in real time before GarageBand for for the iPad even existed. So like you guys were already that that was that in itself was very groundbreaking. I don't think any other app at the time when that first launched on the iPhone was able to do any of that time stretching. That was cool. Um, I know Beatmaker was another one of the the, you know, uh front runners. And um and so it was, it was such an exciting, fun time. It was like, it kind of reminded me of like, even like back in the day when home computers were like a cool new thing, you know, cause now we have this tiny computer in our hands that we can do lots of fun things with. And it was, right. you're breaking free from sitting in front of your desktop and, you know, now you can sit on the bus and mess with beats in that way. Um, and watch videos and you know it was just so wild like wow this is the right. full blown this is what we've been wanting in a phone for many many years and all of a sudden apple came out the iphone and you know the marketing was so perfect of course and it yeah. took off no it's fun to remember those times it's like oh my god this touchscreen is amazing look at all these things you can do you know yeah. in fact it's funny to see it in an xy pad again like that's mm -hmm. you know you've come full circle yeah yeah i was um, gonna say that the lemon drop and your other the fireball had that on there so right um but, you know, that originated on the chaos pad or probably even before that, but that's at least where I first know of it. But like, these are similar ideas that, you know, I, I whose ideas have their time has come and has come again. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was 
a great proving ground. It was great to see like all the cool, innovative ideas there to see lots of little companies going after the, you know, any number of things from like, you know, really you name it. I mean, name something you can do in software and you've got an iPhone app that will do it. I mean, it's especially right. in music, there's so much great signal processing and being able to show waveforms and, you know, so many like scratching on an iPhone. And Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I found an old clip actually. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's from G4 TV. I don't do you remember that? It's like some kind of cable network thing. Um, no, I don't. Uh Attack of the Show was and it was on G4 TV and it was uh, an iPad. I still have a, a copy of it on my blog. Um if you ever want to just see some like nostalgic iPad apps and and whatnot, but they did a real short uh, you know, uh, article uh, video uh, about iPad apps and creating music and loop tastic was in there was featured in there. And then the baby scratch, you mentioned the scratching, you know, the baby yeah. scratch app. And, uh, I think there was one other one. Um, Oh, uh, Korg Electribe, the drum synth Electribe was in there. And, uh, it's just funny to see all that stuff. And like, there was like actual hype on TV about it, you know, now nobody, really talks about making beats on TV on your phone. You know, it's on YouTube. Yeah. It's not, it wasn't on cable right. TV or on big network or anything. But I do remember when that stuff first came out, like that was some of the earliest exposure I had. Like, Hey, you've got this cool device and you've got YouTube to show it off. I mean, that's right. like the perfect combination of watch this, listen to this. That's cool. Yeah. Um, where, you know, we do that now, but it's like, that was some of the first opportunity to do that. Yeah, for sure. So cool. So 1010 Music now, that's it. it uh, you're, you're saying that um, the company's growing. You've got how many employees now? Right. So we now have four full time employees. Um, that includes like a full time developer in addition to myself. My wife uh, pitches in on uh, yeah, yeah. any number of different things. Uh, sure. We've got a full time support test person, Steve, um, Ray is our developer. Uh, we've now got a number of different part time people that I, I lose track of. I mean, you know, talented freelancers like yourself from time to time. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone like Drew Newman, who did the sound development for the, the two synths. Cool. Uh, we've got a world-class industrial designer we've been working with now this entire time. Um, the, the support people at the factory you know, do incredible work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that I'm forgetting someone. We have so many taking care of orders and fulfillment. And we oh, yeah, have a part-time support person. And so it's, you know, quickly becomes like a lot of people to the point that like, I'm, I'm finding that like, you know, there's lots more email than I ever thought I would be dealing with. <laughs> just from inside the company and you know it's a yeah. good problem to have but yes it, it's you know it's also it enables us to do more complete well thought out things like the nano boxes we have two products at once that you both have really good ux design christine did a great job on on planning that and our developer did a great job of making that happen and so it's it's just it's we you know we're growing up we're able to do more sophisticated stuff that's ready to go as soon as you get the first version i mean i, I know our very first products you know, the 1.0 was kind of sad and pathetic and that's no longer the case. Right. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And, uh, and then also I think Matt Yost, my business partner from soundtrack loops helped with the website a little bit. That's right. That's yeah. So I mean, for forgetting that, like website development. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like, it, it, yeah. Oh, and so soundtrack loops just to plug real quick. We've talked about it before, but you know, we, we help work on some presets for, uh, for black box. And um, I want to do on our video, so this will be on my iOS channel. So on the Soundtrack Loops channel, I'm planning to just do like a little uh, lemon drop, maybe like a quick demo with some of the presets and then um, that use our samples and then maybe like a little jammy thing. You know, I'm going to keep it under a couple of minutes, nothing crazy. But if anyone's interested in that, uh, there will be a link above and in the description as well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to shout out to the Soundtrack Loops uh, oh, nice. Lemon Drop contribution, which is some really cool soul vocal samples, which you'll see oh. in there. And especially vocals in particular for granular make fantastic source material. And you can just like dial it in and just kind of have a lot of fun and find you know otherworldly spaces and do some very cool stuff. So thank you for making that happen. Oh, cool. And you know what? Kudos, because I was cruising through the presets and those vocal presets. Um, they're just so like, they're really, really cool. And I only discovered that it, that it came from a, our, one of our soul vocal samples. And I was like, wow, what they did to that. It sound because it's more of like a, just kind of I a didn't vocal. recognize it. Um, if there's anything you want to add to that, 
let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, I don't, I don't know if your audience is familiar with granular synthesis and how that works. We can talk okay. about that if you like, but it's um, just that you're pulling, you know, up to each oscillator has up to 16 different grains that are playing at a given time. They're mm -hmm. generally from about 10 milliseconds to one second in length. You know, we're using a constant sort of half football shaped, a little sinusoid that makes everything blend together nicely. So you can get some really cool tones and um, textures and ambiances from things. Um, we've added a whole bunch of settings to make it so you can, you know, build your own special clouds or, you know, start with the attack and sort of move your way into the middle. Like it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's can be quite versatile, Granted, like textures and ambiances are sort of its, its strong point, mm -hmm. but you can, um, there is a feature that lets you play the attack and then blend into the sustained portion of a wave. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's see what else do I have here. We'll just like wrap it up. It's not too crazy long. Um, how about some, uh, how about a little advice for some young entrepreneurs or young programmers, anything that you could, any advice you could give them would be great. Yeah, I guess I would say, you know, if, if you, if you're inspired to build stuff and you want to, you know, make products and, you know, st potentially start a business, I guess the first and best advice you can give is like, go build something, start somewhere, mm -hmm. especially now there's so many fantastic tools like at Adafruit or SparkFun or, you know, you name it, like you can build you know, some kind of synthesizer or whatever, you know, lighting or, um, you know, speakers or wearables or like all kinds of like cool electronics, mm -hmm. you know, go try it out. Like, you know, put some, get some open source tools because there's so many of them now. Uh, Tizi is a great resource for audio stuff where you could mm -hmm. drop in a synthesizer and you know, do some basic signal processing for like 10 or 20 bucks. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, play around with that stuff. See if you like it. Okay. Uh, if it goes well, show it to somebody, see what they think, you know, try and, you know, make incremental progress. And it's certainly like, yeah, what we're doing now may seem advanced, but it's like we started off small and did some of these same things. And it's right. uh, unless, not until you sort of figure out like, okay, that's promising. Let's do more of that. Okay, let's fold this in too. Let's learn about that. You know, there's so many inexpensive dev boards and great internet videos and things you can try. I mean, it's, you know, I, I shudder to think about what you and I did when we were kids. Like, how do you want to learn something? You go right. to the library and get a book. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or buy a magazine. Remember those? Remember the the little uh, the the computer magazines. What was the one for programming Basic? They always had a snippet of Basic that you could program. In uh, yeah, every... okay. Um, oh, I, I, I was a it. color computer TRC80 color computer fan, so Rainbow was the magazine for that. Yeah. But I know that you know the Commodore sixty four and various others have their own kind yeah, of. Yeah, that, those are fun. <laughs> So to wait for the next one to come out just so I could see if I, and then you hit run and sometimes it just doesn't work. And you're like, I know oh, I typing in a program. Bug. Yeah. Typing in a program from a magazine is just bonkers, but you know, <laughs> that's what we had. Yep. Totally. Well, you, so you mentioned Teensy. So that's a cool one. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the description here in the video. Um, and then what about like those little raspberry Pi things? Like Matt just bought, he bought a raspberry Pi keyboard. It's like a computer. It's all built into a little keyboard, um, or, or even just like little kits that, that involve raspberry Pi or something like that. What do you think of those? Yeah, I'm, I'm less up to speed on that stuff. I mean, I do have okay. raspberry Pi. I have played with it a bit, but I find that the more tailor made, like smaller, more focused stuff. Cause you know, with, with raspberry Pi, you're typically, Hey, get a Linux install, do this. And now it's. Mm -hmm. it's kind of more onerous and burdensome. It doesn't feel as fun and sort of, you know, self-contained and, you know, you could build something into something else and sort of leave it there. Um, okay. I mean, another platform I want to mention is Daisy is something interesting that's come out. That's, you know, kind of alongside the Teensy in that it's a open computing platform that specializes in music. They have a number of different things from your rack modules to tabletop units to you know, guitar pedal type effects thing. Like those sort of tail, if you, know, whatever your interest is, I mean, granted my expertise is more in audio and, you know, signal processing. If that's kind of your thing, like find sure. something, find a toolkit that's sort of ready to go and has lots of Swiss army enough stuff to begin with. Mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi seems a little more general purpose. And while I certainly don't want to knock it, it seems like it's, you know, more, you need to assemble more things to sort of get to a meaningful result. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And you want, it, it helps to see, to, to kind of get instant gratification in the beginning, just because you know you don't want to like, oh, that's Nazi. right. <laughs> that's right. You want to have something that you can fire up in an afternoon and be like, oh yeah, let's keep doing more of this. Whereas a pie, yeah. I think is going to be a little less like that and more, you know, drudgery to get going, but you know, I'm sure others have different experiences than I do. Very cool. Well, thanks for the tips. And, um, 
And, and thanks for your time. Is there anything else you want to add to the, to the interview? No, I guess it's like, that's a great question regarding the the entrepreneur stuff. I guess just realize that there's so many things out there that you can do. And, you know, there's talk to the influencers. I mean, we've really benefited from talking to influencers like yourself, like other YouTubers, like there's so much kind of free publicity. You don't need to like, you almost don't need to pay for advertisement. You just sort of word of mouth carries so much, you know, get yourself out there, learn stuff, do stuff, you know, do it because it's fun. Right. Try to advance your art. You know, I wish you the very best. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And it helps to have something cool to, you know, present. So even like you said, if it's a little thing, um, just something. And, and even if you're, you know, your aspirations are elsewhere to be able to go, like I was part of my job at Native Instruments was hiring people. And there's really, you know, in that space, if you're a, you know, budding engineer or, you know, entrepreneur looking to do stuff like there's really kind of no excuse. It's almost like you need to have something on your portfolio to show like, Hey, I did some crazy plugin or I did some hardware project or, you know, here's something I can show you from my portfolio to demonstrate how good I am and worth hiring. And like, that's, you almost kind of expect that. And that's, you know, a great way to learn your craft and have something to show to a perspective employer. Nice. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully, you know, if those people are watching, you got some good information there. Uh, hopefully you can take that and, and do something great with it. Um, and, and you know what, personally, I don't have a lot of time, but it's always something like I, you know how it is when you're creative or whatever, you, you kind of want to do everything. <laughs> I don't know if you're like that, but it's like, uh, Oh, this came out. That sounds really cool. I want to try that. I want to try this. So I personally, I might even look into Daisy or, or Teensy, uh, after we get off this conversation because, uh, and, and maybe even just kind of tinker with it for my daughter when she's, she's only four now, but maybe when she's a little bit older, she might have some fun with something like that. Um, but it's, cr- it's crazy. It's just, you gotta make the time for it. That's the thing you have to make the time for it. And, um, so oftentimes it's easier to do that when you're younger and you don't have a bunch of other things going on, but, um, also it could be for somebody who it's never too late, you know, somebody who has a lot of free time now, their kids are in college and, and, you know, they're looking for something to do too. So it's a really cool time to be alive. If you have the time to, to reach into those little, uh, pre-made open source, like you said, there's so much open source stuff available right. online, you know, it's almost like they're waiting for you. You just have to have time for it. Right. The, the, the challenge is like choosing where to start and like what, right. which one to use. It's That's true. There's yeah. almost too much, you know, too. There's like so many options and I often feel overwhelmed just with the amount of like odds, little odds and ends and pieces of gear that I have, you know, because I want to, I want to play with all of it all at once. You know, I walk in the room, it's all fired. It's all going through my mixer. But, but then I go, yeah, but this thing's really cool. Maybe I should learn a little bit more about the features in this. And then like, ah, but then there's that. Nah, let's get something new instead. Yeah. And then it's like, then it just gets something new. And now I'm just like, ah, you know. (laughs) So anyway, that's a whole different conversation. They call that gas, right? Gear acquisition syndrome. That's right. Um, So, well, cool, man. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Really appreciate your time. Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure to speak to you. Likewise. Again sometime. Excellent. So everyone go and check out 1010 Music and check out their, their cool equipment. And thanks for tuning in and have a good day, Aaron. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Take okay. care.